I'm Erica Jacoby, and this is another Higher Things video short. Woke Wednesday takes on domestic violence, what's helpful and what's not. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, get the app, donate. If you love what we're doing here at Higher Things, pass it on the face to the next generation. Like our videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel, ring the bell for notifications, get our app, and donate. Your tax-deductible gift keeps Higher Things, a youth organization that's all about the gospel. It keeps us a-rolling. Wednesdays are all about being woke, and today, like the last two Wednesdays, the ladies are taking over. Uh, in addition to Pastor Borghart, whose job it is to normally run the show, um, I have Sandra Madden here as my guest uh, because she is our resident expert um, and serves on the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's Domestic Violence and Child Abuse Task Force. Um, we're here again to uh, to kind of try to wrap this up. I'm not sure if we'll do it this time. If we have to go over to a fourth session, we will. There's so much to talk about this. Um, but today we're going to talk about sort of what is helpful and what is not with domestic violence how you know how to help and how not to help so we'll start with saying hello to both of you hello again hello good to see you um so last time Sandra we we kind of talked about um all right so maybe I've figured out that I am in an abusive relationship um mm -hmm. Things are not going well. We sort of talked about a little bit about how to get help. Can we can we kind of um, talk about that again? What you know, maybe I've figured out because we know abuse abuse victims tend to be sort of isolated. They're part of the uh, control that the abuser have has is they keep them sort of isolated from people that might help them. Um, a lot of times the abused person participates in the lie that everything's okay. There's a lot of shame involved. Um, sort of, sort of, where do I go for help? Do I look after my physical safety first? Maybe there are some kids involved. Do I, do I look over after my spiritual and emotional well-being? Like what, what do I do? Where do I go? Right. It's, um, well, the first question I ask when somebody tells me that they're in an abusive relationship is I ask, are you safe? Are you in a safe place right now? Um, what do you need to do? Where do you need to go to be safe? Because you can't talk to your pastor. You can't worry about, you know, your emotional health or your spiritual health or anything like that if you're dead. <laughs> and that's really what ultimately gets to be at stake when you leave an abusive relationship. It's very, very dangerous. Um, and I know that sounds extreme, but it's the reality a lot of victim's face, unfortunately. And so your physical safety has to take precedence, at least temporarily, um, to be in a safe place to deal with those other things. So there are shelters, there are people, psychologists, counselors, adults, whatever who can help you, and you will need help to leave. Um, whether you are a youth or an adult, this is not something that you are most likely able to plan or execute by yourself in a safe manner. So you're going to have to enlist other people to help you do that, whether that is you have a signal with the neighbors to say, if this happens or the, the blinds are set this way or something like that, then call the police. Or you keep some, you know, a suitcase of clothes at someone's house or um, your parents just take you on an unexpected family vacation so you're not around that person for a while or something. Something needs to be worked out with other people. And if you are afraid to talk to your parents, and I know that's a, the situation a lot of times for people, talk to your friend's parents. Talk to your counselor. Talk to your pastor. Talk to your teacher. There are any number of people out there who are willing to help you and can connect you with the resources available to get you into a safe place. Um, then deal with the emotional, spiritual, um, all those things, because it's going to come crashing down on you and you're going to need help for that, too. OK, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you. For <laughs> OK, makes total sense. Um, but then certainly don't neglect 
getting counseling, getting, oh, going to your cool. pastor. Um, and with, with, with that note, uh, Pastor Burkhart, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, pastoral care, uh, going to your pastor with some help. Can you tell us some, what is the church's answer? And maybe what's helpful, maybe what isn't helpful. Can you kind of talk us through that? We're assuming this person now who's getting help is in a safe place or is able to kind of talk to you, um, talk to their pastor now. Well, I think um, we are still learning how to handle this as a church. I, I think um, the church always runs a little bit slow, and I think we're still learning how to handle this. And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a couple of things that are not helpful. I'm going to lose you. Goodbye, <laughs> Erica. I'm uh, going to lose you, and I'm going to add Sandra. And I'm just going to say some things that are common thoughts that occur in the minds of pastors, and you're going to comment on them, okay? Oh, good. All right. So, look, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just fighting. They just can't get along. We'll do what we always do, and let's just get the two, two of them together. Your thoughts? Absolutely not. That's the worst thing you can do. Um, the problem with that is that you have different power dynamics going on in the relationship. An abuser is using fear and intimidation to control the other partner. If you had people who are on equal footing, who just had communication problems or anger management problems, yeah, maybe that could work. But it does not work when there is abuse going on. The abuser is not, not going to be truthful. They are more than happy to have the uh, victim take blame for the situation. Um, they might admit to some minor part of it, but it's really, you know, ultimately the, the victim's fault. Um, and as you, as a pastor, engage in that kind of thing, you are ending up taking sides with the abuser against the victim. And so the best thing to do is make it part of your pastoral care with couples is to meet with each person separately. That's just your normal practice when you're doing counseling, when you're doing premarital, anything like that, is you meet with them separately to kind of screen. Is this going on? What, are the, what happens when they get angry? Are you afraid? Um, how do they handle these situations? How to... You know, what is your justification for doing whatever that was inappropriate? Um, and see if that is going on. And if there is abuse, then the victim's not going to be open in front of the abuser because there are going to be re repercussions as soon as they leave your office. Um, and so it's not really going to accomplish anything good and can only really bring about worse things. So that is about the worst thing you can do is to put the two in a room and try and hash it out or try to determine if there is abuse going on with the two of them together. You need to make it part of your policy to meet with them individually. You know how you can get and you can just adapt or this one's similar. Mm -hmm. It takes two to tango. So why don't you sort of identify where you're triggering him, which, by the way, yeah. is the abuser is totally pro that one, isn't he? Can we please oh, talk about how she's messed up? Go ahead. If they would just stop messing up my supper or could fold the laundry right or whatever, it would stop waking me up in the middle of the night, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, the, the abuser is more than happy to assign blame on the victim. Um, so no, it does not take two to tango when there is abuse going on. Uh, there is never any justification for abuse. There's just not. I don't care what a victim has done. It does not justify an abuser doing something to intimidate and cause fear or even physically harm the other person that's or threaten to or make them afraid that that might happen. That that's not that's not how a relationship, a healthy relationship works. And so saying that actually makes you, again, side with the abuser. The victim's not going to come out and be get the care that they actually need because they're not going to feel safe talking about it with you. Now, my last one, and then I'll give the my seat up to the to, to Jacoby. Um, <laughs> 
Isn't he the head? Isn't this part of being the head? No, it is not. Yes, he is the head. The husband is the head of the house. I have no problem at all with that uh, title and all that it actually entails in Scripture in Ephesians 5. It's a beautiful, one of my favorite passages, actually. Um, the head of the household uh, in reflecting Christ doesn't just get to have his whims obeyed. That's not how Christ treats the church. Um, it's not about commanding obedience and having your life made easy and being able to, that you should expect those. That's not what submitting is about. Submitting is not being a doormat. Um, and you should not expect, a husband should not expect his wife to, to be that. Why would you want a, a relationship like that? Um, the head of the household is about t serving. Christ had all the headship and authority on heaven and earth, and he used it to serve his church, to serve his bride. And that's how husbands are to act towards their wives, to reflect that headship that Christ has with, his, with the church. And so, no, it is not about being the boss. Uh, so that, that's a complete misapplication of the headship principle. <laughs> okay, so we we're it's about time for us to wrap this up. Um, I want to ask the question about abuse and divorce. Now, obviously, um, abuse happens sometimes even before, you know, in, in high school and in other dating relationships. But I want to ask you specifically, Pastor Borghart, about divorce. It's not God's design, but what we do, what do we do in the context of abuse and the relationship? Is it broken for good? So I'll put the three of us on the screen so that we can all sort of talk about this. Um, The church is really sort of slow on this one. Uh, there are a lot of pastors who would disagree with me that abuse is a reason for divorce. Um, all the reasons for divorce, I think it's abuse, abandonment, and um, adultery. All of them, one thing doesn't, one thing happens does not mean you're out. You know what I mean? I think there, there needs to be counseling. But the first thing is don't rely on us to tell you whether or not you have grounds for divorce. You need to talk to your pastor. He's the one that's been set by, sent by God to answer this question. Um, I, I think that separation would definitely be in order. That's a biblical way of sort of handling this. Um, but what I would say is vows are not being capped if someone is at risk of dying. Okay? And, and go bear your cross isn't enough of an answer. Okay? Yeah. I mean, the cross may be separation. The cross may be being single for a long, long, long time, like the rest of your life. But you're going to have to talk to your pastor about that to come up with what the, what, the, um, what the right way of going is. And I know, Erica, that Sandra's chomping at the bit to really answer this. So <laughs> go. Yeah, um, I, I agree that separation is, is the best way to handle things in the uh, short term. Our culture has this idea that if there's abuse or adultery or abandonment, then, then the next step is to file for divorce and to jump with both feet into the deep end of that pool. And I don't, I don't think that's a good idea, not even just on a spiritual basis. It's, it's not a good idea psychologically because there are a lot of emotions and realizations and counseling, spiritual and psychological, that need to take place to get you in a healthy pit a healthy position to make major life decisions such as divorce. And so I recommend for married people um, separation, but not in terms of just a couple of days or a couple of weeks, in terms of months and time for uh, both people in the relationship to get counseling so that they can learn healthy dynamics in a relationship that are non-abusive, whether it's on the abuser end or the victim end. Um, and so then maybe, maybe God can work a miracle at the end of six months or so that further abuse has not taken place. And maybe as healthier people, they're able to come back together and reconcile that relationship. Um, it's not likely because most times abusers who have that mentality aren't interested in stopping abusing. And so the, they have to then face temporal consequences for that choice to continue to be abusive, which 
may mean divorce and loss of custody of their children or all sorts of other things that are then maybe um, more ju not justified, but a, a consequence of their choices. Um, and, and again, that's something you discuss with your pastor and not, not with us. I want to thank you both for uh, your time in talking about a very difficult subject. I feel like we just scratched the surface. Um, there's just so much to account for. Um, I thought it was particularly powerful, Sandra, are you talking about, um, you know, the first thing not to think about is divorce. I think when someone's broken mm -hmm. and bleeding on the side of the road, they need triage. They need, um, they need comfort and, um, and not to make any big decisions. Um, and I think it was particularly helpful, Pastor Borghardt, talking about going to your own pastor. I um, hope this has been helpful and uplifting to everyone. Um, Woke Wednesday took on domestic violence, what's helpful and what's not helpful. Thanks for tuning in to us. I'm Erica Jacoby, and this has been another Higher Things video short.